In this clip we are going to estimate a vector autoregressive model for a system of three series here. The data we have in this EVIS file are the French, the German and the US long uh, term government interest rates. So let's firstly have a look at these. You should always have a look at the data. Um, so we open all of the three series as a group and you can see these are interest rates expressed in percentage points and let's have a quick look at the data we'll have a line graph mild we have multiple series but we'll put them in one graph and here you can see the series and what you can see is that they generally move together, especially in the latter part of the series. In the 80s there was a period there was where they didn't move that closely together, although the general tendency still, um, still matched more or less. So what we, now, what we are now going to do is to estimate a simple VAR1 model for all of the series. We can delete this graph delete the group yes so we have our three series highlighted and what we now are gonna do is we're gonna highlight the the US and the ordering will matter very soon so we're gonna do the ordering US Germany France and we open we open this as a VAR so here we can specify the VAR we have our three series here so we'll firstly have a quick look at the VAR in levels, although we know they are non-stationary, we possibly shouldn't do that. And we do a VAR with one lag. So what we do is the first lag is one, the last lag is one, so that's a VAR11, one, one, and we have a constant. And we click OK, and we get some VAR. And you can see already that the lag for the US long rate the one period lag for the US long rate, the own lag is very close to one. It's the same for the Germany and for the French series. So that possibly indicates that that's a possible indication that we have non stationarity here. So what we are going to do is we will want to estimate this for stationary series. So the first differences and it's very easy. You just put a D and then parenthesis around your series okay? and that will tell eviews that you want to actually use the first differences you could of course also first create the series and give them new names the different series and then apply the var to these series so we press ok and you see we get very very different coefficients now since we let's see how many coefficients we have we have three variables that means we get three columns one for the coefficients in the US equation, one for the coefficients in the Germany equation, and one for the coefficients in the France equation. In each equation we have, let's see, four coefficients. We have the constant down here in the bottom, and then we have the one period lags in the US equation, one period lag, the own lag, the US lag, one period German lag, one period French lag. Okay, and we have the same for the Germany equation and for the French equation. Let's have a look at which coefficients are significant. Let's firstly see what information we are given. In parentheses we have standard errors, in square brackets we have the t-stats, so we'll look at the t-stats. And we'll firstly see that the coefficient to the one period US lag is significant certainly in the US equation, certainly in the Germany equation, and certainly in the France equation, all with very significant T stats, very larger than two. So the one period lagged change in the US long term rate has an influence on this period's changes in all. No, that wasn't meant to be there. Has an influence in this period's changes in all. Uh, three equations. Now let's look at the one period German lag. Turns out this is only significant in the Germany equation. Okay, so the the change 
in the German long rate from one period ago only has an influence on this period's rate change in Germany. And last period's French change in the long rate interest rate is not significant anywhere. Okay, so we don't actually need that last element to explain the variation in today's changes in the long rates. What we shall do next is to establish whether the fact that we used a var 1, so 1 lag in the vector autoregression model, whether that was sufficient to basically capture the dynamics in the changes of our interest rates. The way to do that is to do a test on the residuals residual autocorrelation. If that one lag is sufficient, then we should find that the residuals aren't autocorrelated anymore. So the one lag of the changes in the long rates capture all the dynamics. So we'll go to view, residual tests, autocorrelation, LM test, and let's use lags of two. So what we get here is two tests. This first test tells us whether the first order autocorrelation is significant and this test tells us whether the second order autocorrelation is significant. So what we what we see is basically that both we have p-values tiny or very close to zero, certainly smaller than any of our usual significance levels. So that means that there is certainly first and second order autocorrelation in the residuals of the VAR1 model. That means the VAR1 model by itself wasn't sufficient to capture all the dynamics. So now that we've established that a VAR1 is most likely not sufficient to model the dynamics, what we shall do now is to see where we can find out how what lag order we should use. So we go to view, lag structure, and we go to lag length criteria. And let's select four. We'll see, we'll, we'll let eViews choose uh, between VAR models up to order four. And this is the table we get. Okay, so it's the table with our information criteria. And let's see what we can find here. We have, we have all sorts of different criteria here. Let's only look at the Akaika and the Schwartz criterion. These are the ones we are familiar with. And we can see that the Akaika criterion selects a lag order of three. Okay, that's where we can find the asterisk. It's the smallest value of that particular information criterion. And the Schwartz information criterion selects a lag of one. Now between these two, which ones would we choose? Well, we've already rejected a lag order of one because we looked at the residual autocorrelation and decided, well, there's clearly is leftover residual autocorrelation. So that by itself would let us decide, uh, possibly go for a lag order of three here. So let's estimate a var three. Go back to the estimation. We change our maximum lag from one to three everything else remains unchanged. We uh, estimate the model. So here we go. Now we have for each equation, we have nine lag coefficients and one constant. So for each equation, we'll have 10 coefficients. Let's not look at the coefficients uh, themselves too much. You can still see that the first set of coefficients relates to lags of the US, of the changes in the US long rate, and they are still, the first lag is still significant for all three equations. The second lag is significant for the uh, US equation, and we could look that, at that in detail. What I now want to look at is whether there's any issues about the non-stationarity of the system or the stability of the system. What we'll do is we'll go to view and uh, we shall go to the lag structure and to the AR, that's starting to be a bit annoying, and lag structure and to the AR roots table. Okay, 
And what we see here is all the roots of our system. And we'll, what we are looking at here is the absolute value. It may have complex roots. What we are interested in is the, the modulus, which is some sort of the absolute value of a complex root. They are all smaller than one, all inside the unit circle. That means this system is stationary. So uh, there's no problem with non-stationarity. Of course, you could try yourself and estimate that VAR model on the levels, not on the changes of the interest rates, and you would find a different picture. So, of course, now that you have chosen a VAR 3, you could check the uh, residual autocorrelation again, and you would hope that most of that is captured and has uh, by the uh, three lags included in the VAR. So hoping that there's no residual autocorrelation, I leave that up for you to test yourself. Now what we're now going to do is we're going to move to the interpretation of this VAR system and you will have learned that the, the main tool to do this is to use impulse response functions. Okay, so how do we do that in eViews? There's a little uh, button called impulse, that sounds alright. So we'll click on this. Now there's a number of things you need to to do on Node. Firstly, let's not use standard arrows. That just makes the graphs cluttered. You can switch on the option and, and see what happens. You get standard arrows for the impulse response functions. We'll choose none. Now if you go to impulse definition, this is where all the magic happens you will have learned that what we usually do is the Holesky decomposition and what is important is in which way we order that decomposition. Here we'll order it from US first to Germany then France. Okay, even if little Anton doesn't like it. Holesky ordering US, Germany, France. Let's let eViews do its uh, magic and here we got our impulse response functions. Let's have a look at this. So what you can see here, one thing I don't quite like about these impulse response functions in EVIS is the uh, the labeling of the uh, of the x-axis. It should really, it would be better if it said 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so forth. But hey, um, it does most of the work for us. We're not going to complain. So you can see there are some impulse response functions that are characteristically different, very, have very different characteristics. Some have non-zero values right from the start in lag zero, what, which is labeled one here. Others start at zero, like this one, this one, and this one. Now it turns out these zero values for the immediate or contemporaneous responses to shocks are imposed by the Holesky decomposition by the particular ordering. So let's look at that in detail. What we have is in the first row we have the responses of the change in the US long rate to first shocks in the change of the US long rate, then shocks in the change of the German long rate and then shocks in the change of the French long rate. The second row will give us the responses of the change in the German rate first to shocks in the change of the US rate, then to shocks in the change of the German rate, and then to shocks in the change of the French rate. And the last row gives us all the impulse responses, responses for the French rate, or for the changes in the French rate, first to shocks in the changes of the US rate, then to shocks in the changes of the German rate, than to shocks in the changes of the uh, French rate. So we ordered US, Germany, France. What that implied is that we ruled out that the US rate or the change in the US rate would be contemporaneously affected by shocks to the German or the French rate and therefore this graph and I didn't want to click on this, this graph and this graph we forced to start at zero. Then the second country was Germany. That, me that meant that we ruled out that changes in the German rate would 
instantaneously or contemporaneously be affected by shocks to changes in French rate. And this is why this graph starts at zero. Okay, so this is what the Holesky decomposition imposed, that we start at zero. The, the ray afterwards, the impulse impulses can become non-zero. So what do we see? In the first column, we see the the responses of the three series to shocks in the US rate. And we see that all of them respond positively. Okay, so immediately, if there's a shock in the US rate, the changes to the US rate, the, this will of course have an immediate effect to the US rate by definition, but it will also have an immediate effect on the German and the French rate. What about shocks to the German rate? We said this was ruled out to have an immediate effect and even subsequently shocks to the German rate don't seem to move the US rate. Okay, it just go, stays basically at zero. Of course, we have an immediate effect by the German rate and indeed the French rate seems to react to German rates changes as well, or shocks in the changes to the German rate. Now, shocks to changes in the French rate really they stay in France. They're neither the US nor Germany seem to react to those. So you would have learned that the ordering of the Holesky decomposition is quite crucial and of course you saw that here already because we enforced these zero starts for the impulse response functions according to the ordering. So let's go back to the specification and let's change the ordering. So we leave Germany in the center, but we exchange the US and France. So US will be last and France will be first. Now oh, we click OK and we can see that we get quite some change. Firstly, let's see which what we have imposed with this Holesky decomposition. We still have in the first row, we have the US equation, second row Germany equation, third row France equation, first column responses to US shocks, second column responses to Germany shocks, shocks and third column responses to French shocks. Now, what you can see is we previously had both Germany and France immediately instantaneously responding to US shocks. This has now been ruled out because the US has been ordered last. That means we now have zero immediately effect, immediate effects of shocks to the US changes in the long rate to the German and the French equivalents. However, and that is different to the previous ordering we had, now you can see a noticeable increase not in of the impulse response functions after the first period. Okay, so after one period here level two, you can see that there is some positive response now to US shocks both in Germany and France. Now what you can also see is now that we change the order we can now see that, for instance, the response of Germany to shocks in France, we are looking at this graph, second row, third column. Now there's a noticeable positive response of the German market to shocks in the French market. We didn't see that before, although it wasn't imposed to be equal to zero. Okay, So that is clearly an, another difference we can, we can see. So without doubt, the ordering is very, very important. And you need to think a little bit about which one makes sense. And I think given the importance of the US, the German, and the French market, it's possibly the first ordering which we used, which makes somewhat more sense than this ordering. Let's go back to impulse response. And what we shall use now, instead of the Holesky decomposition we now use as decomposition method the residual decomposition method. Now what that means is we you, you can see the ordering is disabled, we don't need that anymore. This implicitly assumes that there is no contemporaneous correlation between the residuals. So the impulse response functions which we will see 
very soon as soon as we click OK it will be correct if that's true however they will be seriously misleading if there is contemporaneous correlation between the residuals in the three equations so let's click OK and what you can now see is that basically the following firstly you can see that we have clearly positive effects in the own countries so in the US to shocks in the US in Germany to shocks in Germany and to France to shocks in France that's not surprising and you can see that all off diagonal impulse response functions start at zero and of course that is imposed because we said we assume there is no contemporaneous correlation there's no correlation between the residuals so by definition there's no response of the German market to shocks in the US contemporaneously because remember the VAR itself will only respond one period after because we're, we're having the one period lags the two period lags and the three period lags so co contemporaneous shocks can only come through the residuals and we ruled out any correlation so therefore all these off diagonal impulse response functions will be zero and in general they all seem to be very small if at all we can see somewhat positive responses to US shocks again so that looks very much these ones look very much like the Holesky decomposition the second one we had but there's other changes here so this is all I had to cover in this clip